Okay, things are a little bit different this morning because we've got children in the service with us, which we don't normally do in our second service, as you know. They normally go either into the preschool area or over into the other building for kids. Now, <clears throat> but what I would like to do, because I enjoy having these kids here, I thought about, in fact, when we were talking about doing this, I thought, well, you know, we ought to do something special for the kids. And I thought, I know parents are kind of concerned about the kids acting up or, you know, doing something they shouldn't do in church. I thought we could have like a crying contest or something of the little ones and just kind of let them know it's okay. But, <laughs> but we know they're not used to being in big church, but, you know, someday they're going to be the big church. And so we want them to do that. But what I've done, I have a uh, special bag prepared that my assistant, Bethany Red Raider Hill, is going to bring. And uh, so for the children, and I don't know the ages to put on this, but we have a bag with, it's got some coloring sheets and a couple of puzzles and a little game and some colors in it. So if you think you're too old for that, don't come up or... But everybody else, kids, come up. I'll give you one. But I want to look you in the eyeballs when I give it to you. Okay? Y'all just come. I'm going to get down on a knee. I may need assistance getting back up. All right. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Don't leave yet. I want you to stay right here for a minute. All right. Now they're coming. Now we got them. Come on down. That's what I like is when it comes dancing. Yeah, we got you covered here. Come on down. No, no, no. Don't sit down yet. Stay up here. Stay up here or I'm going to come take them back. Come on. Okay, stay right here. Stay right here. Here you go. Okay, now when y'all get back. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Come back. Come back. Yeah, no, come <laughs> This is what I miss about having kids, see? Now, when y'all get back to your seats, it's going to be time for me to preach. Some of y'all have never heard that, so you're in for the treat of your lifetime, okay? But there's, some, uh, there's one sheet in there that you color, and it's about the same thing I'm going to be talking about, okay? So y'all find that, and y'all color it, and do a good job with it. But if you want to listen, you can listen. So those are just in case you get a little bit bored, because sometimes I might accidentally be that way, okay? But y'all can go back and take to your parents now and be good and color and play the game, whatever. Okay. All right. A couple of announcements to make. You will notice on the seats in front of you, the two QR codes. One of those is for giving. If you need to give electronically, you can do it there. The other is a guest card that you can fill out to let us know you were here today. Or there is actually a paper guest card under the seat in front of you. You can fill that out, drop it in one of the boxes by the door on your way out. And uh, if you'll do that, then Tuesday morning, we're going to send you a gift 
for having done that. And so you won't know what the gift is if you don't do it, okay? Then uh, also, there is a table set up in the foyer with a bunch of devotional books and stuff on it. Don't take any of those books with you. Those are just there for you to look at. If you see one you think you'd like to use in your family or your private time, take a picture of it and you can order it off Amazon. Okay, all of them are available on Amazon. And then uh, on the 31st of this month, we're going to do a thing we call Get in the Game. And it has to do with volunteers. So uh, J.D. will be preaching that morning and he'll be talking about it in there. And we'll be talking about it a lot more before we get there. But that evening, we're going to have a special time where we can come back and those who are interested in getting involved in any of our next gen ministries or any of our ministries, uh, we'll have some time to just kind of let you know what that's about and what it's like and uh, some training for specific positions if you're ready for that. So mark that down. Now, I have an urgent prayer request that uh, I want to share with you and then we're going to pray. Our Teenagers will be going to camp. That's our EDGE student ministries. They're going to camp, not, not tomorrow, but next Monday. They'll be gone the 11th through the 15th. We've had a situation come up where a male volunteer who was going to, as the sponsor for the boys, can't go. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to pray in just a minute, and I'm going to ask God to speak to one of you men sitting out here right now. Doesn't matter your age. All you have to be able to do is pass a background check, which is just a simple thing. We do that from the office for you uh, when you give us permission to do it. It's really more of a kind of a chaperone type position. You don't have to teach any Bible studies or anything like that. The more you're able to do would, of course, be great. Mainly you're there to just kind of help Get the kids where they need to be, when they need to be there, be there. You, you will be sleeping in the same area with them. So I'm going to pray that God's going to speak to somebody. Your age does not matter uh, as long as you're an adult. Uh, you can't be too old. So God just might speak to one of you retired men sitting out here uh, to go and do this. It, it's an urgent need. I believe God meets those kind of needs. So you be listening, men. And... Wives, you can listen too, because God might speak to your husband through you. <laughs> I know about that, okay? So I'm going to pray right now and ask God to speak to somebody. And then at the end of the service, when I give the altar call, you come up and tell me. And if there's more than one of you, that's okay. We'll figure it out, all right? Father, in the name of Jesus right now, thank you that you're a God who cares about the details of our lives. And Father, though we may have been taken by surprise when this situation came up at work and somebody couldn't go to camp, you weren't surprised by it. And I know that there's somebody sitting right here now in this building that could step into that position that you could use in a mighty way. Somebody you might just absolutely blow our socks off when, when we find out who it is. And I am excited to know that, Lord. But I'm asking you, Father, to speak into a man's heart right now and say, I want you to do this. And all of the excuses or all of the problems are just going to vanish away because when God speaks to you, you're going to know it and you're going to respond in faith and say, yes, Lord, I will. There's a story in the Bible in Isaiah chapter 6 and it says there that, that God showed up in the worship place and the glory, the the his glory just filled the place up and a man spoke up and and when god said who will we send for a, a, in our place and someone spoke up and said here am i send me and i'm praying right now lord for a here am i send me that somebody is going to hear this call from you lord today and go and all of the problems that might appear to be there once they make that commitment they're all going to be taken care of and Father, we love you. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, now y'all are believing with me for this. With me. Okay. Open your Bibles, if you will, to Mark chapter 2. 
That's what I like to hear. Mark chapter 2. Amen. All right. God might be speaking to a daddy right now through his son. You never know. <laughs> okay. I don't even know what I'm doing here. Okay, I'll get the right button. Mark chapter 2. And what we're going to talk about this morning is when is it okay or when is the appropriate time to take the roof off the building? When is it okay to do something so drastic as to knock a hole in the roof, to disrupt the service? When, when is it okay to do that? Because there is a time when it's okay. And it's in Mark chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. Follow along with me. And again, he, and when you see a capital H-E, who's that talking about? Jesus. And he entered Capernaum. After some days, it was heard that he was in the house. Immediately, many gathered together so that there was no longer room to receive them, not even near the door. And he preached the word to them. Then they came to him, bringing a paralytic who was carried by four men. And when they could not come near him because of the crowd, they uncovered the roof where he was. So when they had broken through, they let down the bed on which the paralytic was lying. Now, when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven you. And some of the scribes, there are always scribes sitting around somewhere, and some of the scribes were sitting there and reasoning in their hearts. Why does this man speak blasphemies like this? Who can forgive sins but God alone? And immediately, when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they reasoned thus within themselves, he said to them, Why do you reason about these things in your hearts? Which is easier? To say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven? Or to say, arise, take up your bed and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, I say to you, arise, take up your bed and go to your house. Immediately, he arose, took up the bed and went out in the presence of them all so that all were amazed and glorified God, saying, We never saw anything like this. Father, it's your word. And as always, we claim your promise that it does not return void, but accomplishes the purpose you have for it. And I pray today for somebody listening to me who does not have a relationship with you through your son, Jesus. They be convicted of their need for a savior and turn to Jesus. And I pray that all of us, Lord, might take a look around us. And see where faith is needed. Drastic kind of faith, Lord, that goes the extra mile. That takes the hole and puts it in the roof. And we pray this, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, it's a pretty dramatic story, as I'm sure you, you thought as we read that. Because they took the roof off the building. In those days, uh, when Jesus, when this happened... Houses were not, you know, like they are now. They didn't live in gated communities and they didn't lock their doors. In fact, the homes during the daytime were just wide open. And it wasn't uncommon if you were walking down the street and you saw a house and maybe you smelled something cooking or you, you know, just saw somebody sitting in there that you just walk in the house. I mean, that's just what people did. And in this particular occasion, Jesus came back to town and Jesus had been busy. He had been preaching and teaching and he had been, you know, healing sick people. He'd been causing lame people to walk, blind people to see, deaf people to hear. All of this was known. And so the, the word got out that Jesus was at this house and people are thinking, wow, Jesus is there. He, this is that guy, you know, we, we've been hearing about. He's, he's the one that talked to a blind man and gave him his sight. He's the one that raised up a dead person. Man, he's there. Let's go. And so everybody went to the house and they went in. Jesus was there and he started preaching to them. And, and the crowd got so big that you couldn't get in the house. And in fact, you couldn't even get up close enough to the house 
to see what was going on. The door, people just spilled out. People were looking in the windows and, you know, 10, 12, 20 people deep all around the house so that no one else could get in. So these guys come and they have picked up a friend, I guess, a, 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 an acquaintance who was paralytic. That meant he couldn't walk. And they said, oh, man, we got here too late, and, and we got to do something. So one of them said, hey, I know, let's get up on the roof. So they climb up on the roof. They remove part of the roof from the house. They've got some ropes. They tie the bedding that this guy's laying on. They tie that to the ropes, and they lower him down in front of Jesus. That really happened. That's a pretty dramatic thing. It, picture that going on right now, and you think of how dramatic it is. All of a sudden, one of those roof panels is gone, and somebody is lowered down. I'd love to see that kind of thing happen. But the question is, when is that appropriate? When is it okay to destroy the property and do something as dramatic as that? Well, there are four times, four things that we need to see. Verses 1 and 2 tell us the first one. And it says, and again, he entered Capernaum after some days, and it was heard that he was in the house. And immediately many gathered together so that there was no longer room to receive them, not even near the door, and he preached the word. So the first thing is that one simple little phrase there at the end of verse 1 that says he was in the house. Whenever Jesus is in the house, it's appropriate to take whatever uh, steps or measures you need to take to get there. If Jesus is in the house. And now we know that Jesus is with us all the time. I understand that. We're two or more gathered in his name. There he is in their midst. But when you get Jesus and his word together in the house, it is okay to do whatever has to be done to connect the people who need him with him. And that's what this story was really all about. They saw this guy he was a paralytic, and they just wanted to make sure he had his chance at his healing. And they knew Jesus was healing people. So they said, hey, Jesus heals people. He needs healing. Why don't we put the two together? You see, that's the kind of thinking that we need to have. And because if Jesus is doing it, if Jesus is capable, if he is able, then why wouldn't we do whatever it takes to get people with those needs to him so that he can fix it? Why, why don't we do that? that? That's when it becomes appropriate to take uh, the, the roof and cut a hole in it. We do things here that are not drastic like that, but sometimes churches are criticized because we become too entertaining. That You know, they say, oh yeah, those churches, they just got all those lights and smoke machines. We don't have one of those, but, you know, and the musicians are just up there and they're just playing and singing and they're just putting on a show. Let me address that, okay? I don't care if they put on a show, if it attracts people. Because I, I want to be greatly honest with you about this. It is appropriate to do whatever we need to do to get lost people, hurting people, sick people, to get them their opportunity with Jesus. And the last thing in the world we want to do is have a church service that nobody would want to come to. I mean, but we do that sometimes. We think of those things. I mean, I, you know, I was raised in church and, you know, and I, it, it's taken a while for me to get to the point where I am now where I say, man, anything goes. I don't care. If it'll get lost people there, I don't care. If Jesus is in the house, let's do it. It, it reminds me, y'all know I have a son named Ronnie who is an evangelist. Ronnie's done some pretty weird things in churches. And outside of churches, because Ronnie's heart is to win people to Jesus, to preach to lost people, not church people, lost people. And he came to a decision a long, long time ago. It takes one kind of thing for church people to come, but it takes something entirely different for unchurched people to come. And so a few years ago, one of the first things that he did, he went to uh, the Calgary Stampede in Calgary, Canada. And he said, now I'm going to preach there, but how am I going to get the people there? So he 
talked to some people, and he came up with a, a fund, $10,000. And he said, for $10,000, you can get your name in a drawing to win that 10000 But you have to come. At that time, he had a tent they went under. You come in that tent, and you listen to me preach for five or ten minutes. And then we'll put your name in that. It was amazing. Hundreds and hundreds of people were getting saved. And I, I asked him about that. I said, Ronnie, are you sure about this? How, how is it that, you know, I preach every Sunday. and I, A lot of Sundays, nobody gets saved. Preachers all around are preaching and nobody's getting saved. He said, just think about it a minute. You're preaching to Christians. I'm preaching to people who don't know Jesus. Because they've come for a chance to win that money. But I don't care about the money. I want them to know Jesus. See, that, that's when it, it's appropriate when you know you've got something to offer. It's appropriate to do whatever you have to do to get them there. Some of you got friends or family members and maybe you've invited them to church over the years and they never did come. Do whatever you got to do. Bribe them. Tell them, hey, if you'll come to church with me Sunday, I'm going to take you to, you know, windswept. That ain't even here anymore. I wouldn't do that. What's your favorite restaurant there, Mr. Corley? Uh, I'm going to go with Papa With what? Papa Do's? Well, we don't even have one of those here. Okay. So take them all the way to Houston, Sugar Land, or somewhere to Papa Do's. Red Snapper Inn. Just make sure that you can get there. See, why, why don't we do things like that? It, it, we come up with the money to do it. If you don't have it, I'll, I'll see to it to get it. If, if it'll get them here to hear the word of God to meet with Jesus, it's worth doing it. Number two. So first, it's when you know Jesus is in the house, it's appropriate to do whatever it takes to get people who need Jesus into that same house with him. Okay. Number two. Verses three and four says, and then they came to him bringing a paralytic who was carried by four men. And when they could not come near him because of the crowd, they uncovered the roof where he was. So when they had broken through, they let down the bed on which the paralytic was lying. The second <coughs> time that it's appropriate is when your compassion exceeds your fear. I am convinced one of the biggest deterrents to people either witnessing to somebody about Jesus or inviting people to church is fear. I know that sounds silly, but it is. It's fear. What if they say no? What if they don't like me anymore? What if they won't come? What if I take them to church and they don't like it? All of those fear factors, see, come in. But if our compassion for the lost, for the hurting, outweighs our fear, then we'll do it. Whatever it is that we have to do, we'll take that chance. So all the kids out there that have the, uh, the bags, you've got some paper. One of those papers is a picture of what I've been talking about. <laughs> Any of you know? Oh, this young lady. Over <laughs> are you doing one? <laughs> okay, see, the, it's pictured there. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Oh, y'all find that? From there on, you're on your own. I don't know. <laughs> okay. But these guys saw this man. They looked at him in a different way than probably most other people did. Because back in those days, when you were crippled or you had some infirmity like that, people thought it was because of something you did. They thought it was your sin that caused that. They just basically thought you were a bad person. Nobody wanted to have anything to do with you. And oftentimes, these people were drugged down to the temple or the marketplace, and they were just left to lay there all day long begging when people come by for them to give them a penny or two. That was their life. So a lot of the good upstanding church people, see, they didn't want anything to do with those people. I don't want anybody to see me with him. I don't want anybody by seeing me with her. I don't want to be identified with that group. I'm better than that. I don't, I don't want to be with them. There's a story in Acts chapter 3. Peter and John were about to go into the temple to pray. 
And on the way in, there was one of these beggars. You know, he was a cripple. And he was laying there by the, because somebody put him there so that he could beg from the church people as they went in. Because church people, you know, for all their faults, they will throw a dime or two out there. And so they, they did that. And, but Peter, the Bible says, stopped. And he fixed his gaze upon him. He looked at him. Probably the first person that had ever walked by and taken the time to really look at him. And he looked at him. He had compassion on him. And he said, look, I don't have any silver or gold. But what I do have, I'll give you freely. In the name of Jesus, take up your bed and walk. That dude jumped up. Started walking. It was a miracle. Just like the miracle that has already taken place in here, I believe, this morning. Because God has spoken to one of these men in here. And he went leaping and praising God into the temple. Because somebody took the time to care. Somebody had some compassion. And somebody spoke to him where everybody else just walked by. Look, we, we got people around us every day. We don't want to be around them. He's got a reputation for drugs. Or he's got a reputation for drinking. Or he can't stay in a relationship. Or he's this or he's that. And we don't want to be around them. We don't want to be identified with them. And so for that reason, because we're afraid of what other people would think, we don't want to spend any time with them. We've got to quit doing that. Invest in people that other people overlook. That other people won't get around. They won't bite you. They won't hurt you. And whatever other people think doesn't matter if you can get them into the house with Jesus, even if it means taking the roof off the building. They are worth it. Your friends, your family members that are rebels are people for whom Jesus died. That simple. And many of them don't even know it. Because we're not telling them. We're telling them, straighten up your act. Get your act together and come to church and Jesus will help you. And Jesus is saying, don't wait till they get their act together. Bring them to me. I want to put their act together. But our compassion has to override our fear in order to do that. Number three. Verses six and seven. Now, keep this picture in your mind. You know, you got Jesus there talking. You got people just elbow to elbow all the way around, even outside. And all of a sudden, somebody notices, hey, there's a hole in the roof. Hmm. Somebody coming down that hole. And they start lowering this guy down right in front of Jesus. That's what everybody is seeing. And verse 6 says, some of the scribes were sitting there. And reasoning in their hearts. Why does this man speak blasphemies like this? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Now these scribes were like. I, don't, I hate to use the word theologian. But you could call them that. But heartless theologians maybe. Their job. They were like human copy machines. Or human printers. Their job was to just rewrite the scriptures and rewrite the laws over and over again. They, they, would just, they could write beautifully. But in doing that, they became like experts on the law. So they knew all the right things to do and the wrong things to do and how to do it. They knew what punishment was due for this and what punishment for that. So they're observing this whole situation. Jesus spoke to that man when he came down, and I skipped over that verse, but I'll get to it in a minute. And, and Jesus said, your sins are forgiven you. And so these scribes, man, they, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. I had never copied anything from God's word yet that said Jesus or that some person here could forgive sins. I, I don't think that's right. He's blaspheming. You know, that we, we got to do something about him. We got to do something about him. What happened was their focus had turned so inward that was number three, I think, is this inward focus. They became so inwardly focused, they didn't care about people. They, all they cared about was maintaining purity of their doctrine, purity of their theology. Let's make sure every T is crossed and every I is dotted. Let's make sure everybody does everything they're supposed to do. And whenever your focus is so inward that you can't see anybody on the outside... 
We don't have to worry about you cutting a hole in the roof. You wouldn't dare do that because it's not appropriate. And that's the way they were. Jesus, with all this stuff going on, I mean, the roof's got a hole in it. Somebody's house. And all these guys are worried about is what Jesus said. Can he really say that? Why don't somebody say, hey, who's going to fix that roof? They didn't care, really. It, it was just the, the doctrinal purity is all they were interested in. And, and we got plenty of people like that these days. That, that's why we're all so critical of other ministries and other preachers. I mean, just go on Facebook for a few minutes and see how people bash Joel Osteen and how they bash this person, bash that person. Well, I, I don't know, but last time I checked, there's a lot of people going to Lakewood Church. A lot of people getting saved at Lakewood Church. Maybe not on the TV broadcast, but you don't know what goes on in all those other groups that they have. So how about instead of criticizing them, we find out, hey, maybe there's something you're doing that we could do. I don't know. It's just an idea. Crazy idea. The point is, we can't be so inwardly focused that all we worry about is, you know, there used to be, when I was a Baptist, there, we had all kinds of sayings about this, like, uh, us four and no more. And, you know, church getting too big and, and all those kind of things. And uh, is this when I shared that story in the 830 service about the church in Oklahoma? See, I've experienced this, and I don't think people set out to be this way. It just happens because we worry so much about the church. We've got to protect the church. We've got to keep the church safe. We don't want any heresies going on. We don't want this going on or that. And our church that I pastored in Oklahoma, one of them, every year, every summer in Oklahoma, the big thing was going to Falls Creek to youth camp. And it's a huge camp and, and great camp. They always had great preachers and you'd take you know the churches would take your youth groups and you'd get your youth groups to invite all their friends because it was a great time for kids to get saved and you know get you know fired up for Jesus so our church had done that and we came back and then we did like most churches would do then on the Sunday morning when they came back from camp we would take a few minutes in the service and let the kids you know maybe share something God showed them and present the ones that got saved but well, we had a bunch of kids got saved one year. I mean, a bunch of kids. So I let the kids talk and introduce the ones that had gotten saved, let them say something. And it took a little time. We didn't get out at 12 o'clock that day. And I wasn't thinking anything about it. I'm thinking, man, this is exciting. We've got these kids that, you know, God's spoken to some of them. Some of them got saved. Everybody's going to be so fired up about this. We'll obviously revival come to the church. Then we had a deacons meeting that night. <laughs> One of the deacons had a business in his home. And they would close on Sunday mornings till church was out. They would open at like 1230 or something. I, I don't remember. Well, that day, he let me know. You took too long this morning. I said, well, we had all these kids saved. No, he said, well, you should have anticipated that and not preached. As long. He said, by the time we got home from church, people had already been to our door and left because nobody was there. So it cost him some money. You see, that's what happens when you turn inward. And, and I don't fault that man. It's just where he was in his life, in his spiritual life. And, and you know, I, I don't think he intended to be that way. But you see how easy it is to worry more about maintenance of the church and maintenance of my personal life, making sure that I can do what I want to do. All of that is an inward focus. And sometimes when it gets that way, you need somebody radical enough to come in and take up the roof and put a hole in it and lower somebody down that nobody cares about and see what God wants to do. So when you become so inwardly focused, it's time for God to do something. It's time for somebody to step out. Number four. Go back to verse five now. They lowered the man down and it says, When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, 
Your sins are forgiven. Your sins are forgiven. When you reach a place in your life where your faith will not be denied, that's when you need to start cutting holes in the roof. That's when you need to start doing whatever it takes. And I, I thought it was interesting. There's a little bit of a, a progression to that because it says, you know, they came, they lowered the man down. Jesus saw their faith. Before Jesus said anything, he saw something. And I think sometimes we get confused and we think that God responds to need. And he doesn't respond to need. Think about it. If God responded to need, there wouldn't be any needs, right? There wouldn't be any needs. But there are needs. God responds to faith. When he sees faith. And when others might have looked at those guys and saw crazy people. People that don't care about the building or about the church. Jesus looked at them and he saw their faith. He said, these guys believe. These guys really believe I can heal that man. And they're not going to be disappointed. Because he saw their faith and first he forgave his sins. And see, a lot of the people there probably thought the reason he was on that mat in the first place was because of sin. So Jesus took care of all of that in one fell swoop. He just said, son, your sins are forgiven. And of course, the scribes now, these inward focused people are thinking, wait a minute now. We can't have that going. We can't have some erroneous teaching going on because we don't believe anybody can forgive sins but God. And Jesus looked at him. He said, okay, now I know what you're talking. I know what you're thinking. So let me ask you a question. What's the easiest thing to do? Say your sins are forgiven or to say take up your bed and walk. But so that you know that I have the authority to forgive sin. Then he looked at the paralytic and he said, take up your bed and go home. Walk home. And you know what happened? That sucker got up, picked up his bed, Went home. <laughs> he got home. This part's not in the Bible. <laughs> he got home. His wife said, where you been? <laughs> he said, well, you didn't see a while ago when uh, all those guys came by. My buddies came by and picked me up. Yeah, I saw you leave. Well, they took me to church. Oh, well, how was that? Well, we couldn't get in. Well, what'd you do? Well, they cut a hole in the roof. They lowered me down on a basket. They tore up the church roof. Yeah. Well, what happened then? <laughs> I can't even say it. Jesus was there. <laughs> oh, Lord, have mercy. And Jesus looked at me and told me my sins were forgiven. Oh, really? What happened after that? Then he told me to take up my bed and walk. Honey, I walked home. No, I did. You never walked a day in your life, but I walked home. It was the most amazing thing. I felt this burden of sin lifted from me. And all of a sudden there was life and power in my legs. And I got up and I walked. I actually ran here just to see you so you would know. All because somebody cut a hole in the roof. We, we can see stories like that repeated. We can see that happening. <laughs> we can see it. I, I don't know who God spoke to a while ago, men. But if you don't come forward at the end of this service, I'm going to pray God. <laughs> no, I'm not. We need to hear that God answered that prayer. We need to hear. Not because of the need, but because we're believing that God did it. And what he did 2,000 years ago, he still continues. There ain't no place I read in my Bible where it said Jesus got through. It does say in my Bible that what he began, we continue. And that's what we're doing. Let's bow our heads together. <clears throat> Let's bow our heads together. Okay, we're going to have a, what we call an altar time here the band's going to come back up. They're going to sing in just a minute. And there may be somebody here today. There's quite a few people here that I don't know. There may be one of you that 
you would say to me, preacher, I, I don't understand this about Jesus. Let me give it to you very quickly. The Bible says that all of us are sinners. Every single one of us has sinned. And the Bible says that what we deserve because of our sin is we deserve hell. 